Before we start, just a heads up that this episode mentions suicide. Please take care while listening. I was one of the best uh, defensemen in Alberta. You know, I could run a 40 at 4.7 seconds. I could run down wide receivers off the line. You know, I was a 250-pound half-native guy. When Colin Big Bear Ross played high school football, he was a force to be reckoned with. I was very aggressive on the field. There was pretty much nobody who could go toe-to-toe with me. But off the field, life was complicated. I had a goal to be a football star, and that ended when I was 21 years old. And I started trying to take these paths of making easy money, you know, drug dealing, getting in with the wrong crowds, and it led me to a very lonely path. Colin would walk that path for years. And then, when he was 40, he says he hit rock bottom. I tried to commit suicide in 2019. I was unsuccessful. I had made my way to the mountains where I am now. And yeah, I dropped to my knees. I started praying to the creator to save me. And uh, literally a light switch went off. The next day I started seeing visions. I started feeling my life again. I put down the drugs, put down the booze and the awakening started. I started getting very insane divine visions. And uh, I heard a voice tell me that I was to be a voice and I was to be a leader against this war against evil. And I, I stood right into it. Colin has spent the past four years honing that voice. He's become an influencer, dispensing inspirational wisdom on TikTok, where his videos have been seen millions of times. I have a really large voice in Canada. You know, I was a big influencer at the Freedom Convoy in Ottawa. And that success led to a clothing brand, an online store, and now a speaking tour. I've been going across the country nonstop. It's sort of hard to know why Colin's become so popular. He's charming and affable, but a lot of what he's putting out are pretty generic self-help videos. You can't heal the world until you heal yourself. Hate breeds more hate. We need more love in this world. We need more humanity. But there is one thing that sets Colin apart from the other influencers on TikTok. You know, the world's run by a bunch of disgusting pedophiles, human traffickers. People think this is a war of a flesh, but it's not. This is good versus evil. This is a spiritual war that we're in right now. Colin Big Bear Ross is convinced that the world is about to be taken over by a secret cabal of elites. Every governing body across the nation has been infiltrated from the top down. It's a pyramid, right? When we talk about the top of the pyramid, you know, we've heard Rockefellers, we've heard Rothschilds. We truly don't know exactly who it is, you know? Some people say the Jews. These are the globalists. These are these rich billionaires around the world who have a very small circle and a very poor agenda for the planet. What's going on right now is a genocide of humanity. You know, they're trying to kill us. (laughs) Like, there's no other way to say it. I'm Taylor Owen. And I'm Sapria DeVetti. On this season of Screen Time, we're trying to figure out how we ended up in a world where facts are fluid and your reality is a reflection of your ideology. From TVO Today, Antica Productions, and the Center for Media, Technology, and Democracy at McGill University, this is screen time, the battle for reality. I think if we want to understand someone like Colin Big Bear Ross, We need to step back a bit. I'll try and be as brief as possible because it's a long story. This is Frank Graves. He's the founder of a public opinion firm called Ecos Research Associates, where he's been tracking how long-term social and economic trends have led to things like political polarization and radicalization. Really for the last decade, we've been studying a number of forces which are really changing the character of our society, economy, our class structure, in ways which aren't readily visible to those looking at it on a day-to-day basis. The most notable of those, I think, has been a real collapse of the era of shared prosperity, middle-class dream, all of that idea. So we found that people 
who identified as members of the middle class in Canada and the United States had dropped from 70% to under 50%. So you've had a collapse of this shared prosperity model, and that also triggered a number of other things, things like rising cultural insecurity, hostility to outgroups, a magnified sense of external threat. All of these factors coalesce, and we've seen since this period, they've produced what some call an authoritarian reflex. And it's been manifest in, for example, what happened in Brexit, what happened in the United States with Donald Trump. And we found when we started applying these models in Canada, they were remarkably predictive of what was going on in Canada. And this has really sorted our electorate and our citizenry in ways that we haven't seen before. This collapse of the middle class and the cultural backlash that's come with it could explain why someone like Big Bear has found solace in conspiracy theories. This world that we're in is already broken and the system doesn't work. It's crumbling, it's rotting at the core. Frank Graves says that as inequality has risen, we've become more and more polarized. And the pandemic only made things worse. What happened then as the pandemic went on and on, the earlier forces of polarization that we had seen really producing deep divisions in Canada, expressed themselves and superimposed them on the debate about the vaccine. It became a lightning rod, a trigger. And what was different this time is that although there's always been disinformation around, it started being far more pervasive and far more effective in the past. So a lot of the fault lines which we've seen emerging now became reinforced further by a significant amount of disinformation. And its impacts are dramatic and profound and corrosive. They are producing two incommensurable candidates, so starkly divided that it's really hard to see any common ground whatsoever. Canada certainly feels polarized right now. And Frank says that's borne out in the data too. When his research firm Ecos asked people about the Freedom Convoy, for example, only 3% of NDP and Liberal voters said they supported it. But among supporters of the far-right People's Party, that number shot up to 89%. It's not like a little higher, it's like another planet. Maybe that's not totally surprising though. After all, the freedom movement is fundamentally libertarian. So it makes sense that it picked up steam on the right, but not the left. But then Frank had another idea. What if there was a correlation between supporting the freedom convoy and being misinformed? So he designed something called the Disinformation Index, where he presents people with a series of false statements and says that the more you agree with them, the more misinformed you are. Yes, there are areas where there are vagaries. So we try and stay away from those because there's no vagary when you ask the question, do the vaccines alter your DNA? No, they don't, period. Frank reran the numbers for the Freedom Convoy poll. But instead of using political affiliation, he used his disinformation index. And the results were telling. According to Frank, the higher someone scores on the disinformation index, the more likely they are to support the freedom movement. These differences aren't, oh, look, it's 10% higher, 20% higher. No, they're like 10, 20 times higher. These effects that we don't see in social science normally. These are like physics levels effects. And the convoy is just the tip of the iceberg. Frank says the disinformation index can be used to predict where people will land on a whole range of issues. So for example, we've seen that support for dealing with climate change, it's gone down somewhat recently. And it really hasn't gone down with the 60% of the Canadians who are informed. It's really that it's intensely been rejected by those in the disinformed portion. But then the sort of psychographics are even more dramatic. So, for example, most of the people who are highly disinformed, they don't even think the country is like in a recession. They think it's in a savage recession or a depression. They think that inflation rates in Canada are dramatically worse than in other countries, which is not true. One way to read all of this is that mis- and disinformation are actually changing the way people see the world. But there's another interpretation. It's possible that some people are just predisposed to believing misinformation because of their lived experience. They might feel like the government or the media hasn't always looked out for them. So they're skeptical of official narratives about things like vaccines. 
In that interpretation, misinformation isn't changing people's beliefs, it's reinforcing them. Frank acknowledges that determining causality here is tricky. It's not a billiard ball type linear causal framework. There's mutual causal relationships which are interacting. But whether misinformation is the disease or the symptom, it's clear that people are losing faith in our institutions and in each other. For example, trust in public servants. Since the beginning of the pandemic, it's declined every single time we've asked it to the point where it's now 25%, which is lower than it's ever been. And you go, oh, well, people are just upset because they couldn't get their passports or whatever. No, trust in journalism has followed exactly lockstep the same path. And you look at things like confidence in the direction of the country. It's pretty close to historic lows. If you're not in, you're on the cusp of a legitimacy crisis. So trust in our government is waning. And as we saw last episode, foreign actors like Russia are fanning the flames of discontent. But rather than address that underlying mistrust, Frank says that the political establishment may actually be making the problem worse. Then if you go, well, you know, as Hillary Clinton did, you're just a basket of deplorables, or even Mr. Trudeau said that's just a fringe. That just adds emotional fuel to the fire, because there's a reason they're there. Because this group is the ones that are actually feeling the greatest sense of economic anxiety, status and identity loss. Ultimately, I think if you want to put the genie back in the bottle and solve this, you're going to have to confront those. After we spoke to Frank Graves, I started to wonder what a different response to the convoy and all the issues that led to it might have looked like. What if the vaccine debate hadn't been so divisive? This is Michelle Rempel Garner. She's the Conservative Member of Parliament for Calgary Nose Hill. So I was the vice chair of the Standing Committee on Health during the pandemic, and I was the opposition shadow minister for health. And at about the same time, like it was early 2021, the Canadian Royal Society had issued this really remarkable paper on why Canadians would be vaccine hesitant. And when I first read this paper, I was like, okay, here's the roadmap on how to address vaccine hesitancy. It's fact-based. It provides a way to address concerns in a constructive way without dismissing them, but also without validating non-fact-based positions. And of course... What happened during that time was rapid, extreme politicization of the issue of vaccine hesitancy. So rather than a public policy discourse emerging where it's like, okay, some people actually have valid reasons to be vaccine hesitant. It was either you're an anti-vaxxer or you want to push a poison into me. You know, when you think about how poor the public policy outcomes were because of the tone and tenor and the divisiveness of that debate, number one. And number two, how much that whole climate really polarized Canada into a place that I don't think we've recovered from. That keeps me awake at night. I'm deeply concerned about that. How are we as a country that's a pluralism, how are we to solve big issues that affect the maintenance of that pluralism, the maintenance of our democracy, if we're so divided? Those deep divisions aren't just a threat to our democracy. They've also created a breeding ground for conspiracy theories. And when polarization collides with disinformation, the results can be pretty scary. I still get emails from people saying how I was killing people because of this vaccine. Dr. Bonnie Henry is a provincial health officer in British Columbia. During the pandemic, she became one of Canada's most prominent public health figures, known for her mantra imploring people to be kind, to be calm, and to be safe. The New York Times called her one of the most effective public health officials in the world. But not everyone saw her that way. The dehumanizing, the othering. So, you know, you're a Nazi, therefore it's okay for me to say you should be killed or to threaten you. The sexualized violence in some of the vitriol I received. And that is something that is not It's not okay. That online harassment spilled into the real world, too. 
very direct physical threats from people who came to my house and tried to break in, and then death threats that were sent to me, people who had my home address on placards in front of the legislature protesting and encouraging people to go and shoot me, and like very specific things that were quite unnerving. I still have security who go with me when I'm outside. And the challenge that we have is that there's a very long shadow now. When something is out there in social media or online, it's there. So my home address, my phone number, my family, it's out there. And people will be able to find it years from now. When Dr. Henry thinks about where this might lead, she thinks about the author Salman Rushdie. Rushdie became a target of harassment and death threats in the late 80s after he published a book called The Satanic Verses. He spent years in hiding, fearing he'd be assassinated. In August 2022, he was stabbed in the neck while doing an interview on stage. It was 35 years ago he published that. And somebody who was born in the US, became radicalized online, knew nothing about him or his work, stabbed him and tried to kill him because of that shadow that's out there. Online harassment is becoming almost ubiquitous for women in the public eye. People threatened to kill Dr. Henry because she advocated for vaccines. People threatened to kill me because I fact-checked misinformation back when I was a radio host. And people have threatened to kill Michelle Rempel Garner too. so I don't get more death threats, I have to clarify my position on this. Over the last few years, Michelle has been thrust into a tangled web of conspiracy theories about the World Economic Forum, which is essentially a think tank for politicians and wealthy business people, founded by a German engineer named Klaus Schwab. But in conspiratorial circles, it's an evil organization hell-bent on world domination. I've had death threats and extreme harassment over that issue. This all revolves around Michelle being named one of the World Economic Forum's Young Global Leaders in 2016. The Young Global Leader program is like an elite social network for accomplished, politically engaged young people. Alumni include everyone from Mark Zuckerberg to Will I Am of the Black Eyed Peas. Now, conspiracy theories aside, there are lots of legitimate criticisms of the World Economic Forum. In February of 2022, you wrote a piece for The Line, you know, basically clarifying that the World Economic Forum might be a bit of an elitist douche apocalypse. I am paraphrasing your words. <laughs> but they're not exactly this, like, all-knowing, all-powerful, puppet-string-pulling organization. I think you accurately described what... The, the World Economic Forum has become, which is just, it, it's a bunch of, um, and I, I'm going to clarify why I'm saying this, dangerous elite lefties. And dangerous because they actually trade on saying that they own people in the government. Like Klaus Schwab actually went out and bragged and said, I own cabinet ministers. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but something to that effect. So if we penetrate the cabinets, so yesterday I was at a reception for Trudeau. I would know that half of this cabinet, or even more half of this cabinet, are actually young global leaders of the world economy forum. In case you missed that, what Schwab said there was that the World Economic Forum penetrates the cabinets of governments, including ours. So you can see why people might think his organization is more powerful than they should be. But in reality, just because you are a young global leader doesn't mean you're beholden to Schwab or even care about his agenda. For people like Colin Big Bear Ross, though, these ideas about the World Economic Forum have taken on a life of their own. They've deceived us and they're working against us for their own selfish gains, right? There's a plan 
we, we all know it, the Great Reset, you know, Klaus Schwab has openly talked about this. Even Jason Kenney, early in the pandemic, spoke about it in Alberta. And we called him Flip Flop Kenny because he was all for this standing against this great reset. And it's like someone held a gun to his head at some point or they offered him a large amount of money to play along. I can't say I have all the answers to what's going on, but I can tell you I'm learning a lot of it and the world's run by a bunch of evil friggin' pedophiles that have no good intention other than to destroy humanity. The biggest concern that I have is that Canadians feel like shadowy organizations are in control of the Canadian government. And it really concerns me that Canadians so quickly and so rapidly are in a place that they feel like they're not in control of the public policy discourse because we are a democracy and everybody has the ability to participate in it. I don't come from wealth. I don't come from a political family. And yet, you know, I've served in the cabinet of a G7 country. Anybody in this country can walk the same road because our system allows for it. And I, I just want people to understand that they are empowered to do that and to not buy into these narratives that somehow, you know... That we don't have agency. Yeah, that we don't have agency, exactly. Because we do. Now, that's true. But Michelle would also be the first to admit that actually running for office or becoming a public servant, that now comes at a significant cost. I do know that people watch people like me and they go, I, I don't want to go into public service. No, thank you. I'm good. <laughs> and that really worries me because I think you're seeing more people of all walks of life that would be amazing political leaders in this country whose perspectives are desperately needed self-deselect because of where we are in terms of that divisiveness, misinformation, disinformation, hostility. Reasonable people with the reasonable voices are being silenced. Dr. Bonnie Henry shares Michelle's concerns. But if those voices get silenced, then we're losing. So I worry about that. And I worry that means that people will not want to go into public life and take on that risk. Dr. Henry points out that most people are still civil, but those voices don't tend to be the ones we hear. A small group of people with a very loud, very vicious voice are taking over. And then reasonable people get caught up in some of it. And we saw that with the convoys that were going to Ottawa. You know, they're upset because they've been hurt and they've been harmed by things that have happened, but they become part of this movement that is designed to do other things, to create instability, to actually attack individuals. And it's, I think that sense of belonging to a group that feels the same way and that recognizes and supports you in the fact that you've had a hard time and you've been hurt by something is very appealing to some people. And it's unfortunate, but it, that leaves them open to being manipulated by a small proportion of people that have ulterior motives. This is the thread that runs through all of this polarization, radicalization, and discord. Most of the protesters who took part in the Freedom Convoy were there for the right reasons. The pandemic was really hard, and they needed an outlet to voice their pain and frustration. There's real value in people protesting government mandates or challenging the power of the World Economic Forum, or being skeptical of how quickly we developed a vaccine. We should be having those conversations, but those conversations need to be grounded in reality. Instead, what's happened is that people or organizations or countries have tapped into these anxieties for their own gain, and they've shattered our information ecosystem and our shared reality in the process. This isn't the usual, oh, you know, we're in a bad spell. These are things which they're so enmeshed in our current democracy that I, I don't see them as being sustainable in the long term. So something's gonna happen. And this problem is only getting more complicated because disinformation is about to become a lot more convincing. The last six months, there have been really significant shifts in what we call synthetic media, which is the ability to create realistic images or audio 
of events that never happen. That's next time on the final episode of Screen Time, the battle for reality. The Battle for Reality is written and produced by Mitchell Stewart. It's hosted by Sapria Dovetti and me, Taylor Owen. Our associate producer is Emily Morantz. Mixing and sound design by Mitchell Stewart and Philip Wilson. Our associate audio editor is Cameron McIver. Our executive producers are Stuart Cox and Laura Regeer. Lori Few is the executive producer of Digital at TVO. Shariar Tadvidi is the managing editor of podcasts and digital video at TVO. If you want to know where we got our information from, we've included an annotated transcript in the show notes. 